Insofar as experts are concerned, we have two amazing, absolutely amazing social media uh, celebrities with us here today. Uh, Kenya Gibson from iHeartRadio. Uh, Kenya, can you wave so everybody sees you? All right. And also Tara Ackaway from uh, uh, SocialWise. And she is just an amazing PR person who is, uh, she's an entrepreneur. She started her own business. And she's just really takes PR to the next level. So we're really glad to have her here. They're both amazing experts, and I know that you're going to learn a lot. And as I mentioned, we're going to have we're going to let them present a little bit uh, before the program. We thought it would be kind of fun if they kind of shared notes about social media. And so to kick things off, I think we're going to ask just a very basic question: What is uh, social media? So welcome everyone, happy to be here. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this. So what is social media? I probably couldn't answer that for you probably five years ago when I accidentally like stepped onto Instagram and was kind of playing around with it just from a personal standpoint, trying to understand like the mechanisms of social media and why anybody would wanna be on this thing. But I would say a definition of social media for me is it's a resource tool. It's a social resource tool and a platform that allows us to connect, right? And in this case, in day and age, we can also use it to gain momentum with our brands and also build our businesses. So that's what I would say my definition of social media is. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you here virtually. When I think about social media, because I'm a publicist, I think about it from a PR standpoint as well, because they're very closely related. Um, I work with a lot of business owners, entrepreneurs, startups, and so social media acts as their portfolio in a lot of ways, um, definitely more than one. And sometimes it's used and it's viewed more importantly or used as a tool, a mechanism um, in a stronger way than their actual website. And so when I think about social media, I think of it as storytelling. How are you introducing yourself to a brand, to an investor, to the media itself? How can you make yourself stand out from the crowd? And so, of course, we'll get into specifics, but every different platform that is out there that exists should be utilized in a very different, unique way. And so if you're just kind of taking your standard content and regurgitating it onto every platform, you're doing yourself a disservice. And so think of it from my standpoint, I think of it as storytelling. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's great. Um, so let me ask, you know, why use social media? I mean, what are the advantages of social media over other types of advertising? Well, I think, you know, for me, it's it's an opportunity, you know, coming from the broadcast space of having another platform to do things in real time. One of the things I've always loved about radio, um, even over TV, is that we're able to kind of pivot really quickly on the airwaves and do things like as things are happening. And I think that social media lends itself as an additional platform to that. So, for example, if we're breaking a story or there's a really important content piece that's happening in the moment. We can now use social media to leverage, right, and to create another opportunity for that story to be shared and then also create those real-time engagement and conversations around what we're breaking from a content perspective at the time. And I think what's great about that for brands is, right, so if you had something that's really pressing that you had to get out or you had something that you felt was an important topic, right? There is now a way to engage with all these other folks who sh share similar interest uh, in a more uh, quicker, efficient way. That's great. Um, so, so Tara, what, what, what do you think? Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, again, I always look at it a little differently because I'm looking at it from a PR standpoint as well. But when you think about social media, it's a way to have instant gratification, instant connection, instant access. Um, if you are a brand, you have a business, you're focused on e-com, it's a pool of customers. It's a pool of people that can become followers and then soon become fans. I My background comes from the entertainment industry. And so even currently, I work a lot with Bravo TV and MTV and, and Hulu and Netflix and different shows, uh, in addition to major startups. And one thing that we see time and time again is that it is an immediate way to make a connection, to sell a product, 
to build a real meaningful relationship with your fans, your followers, no matter how you're looking at it, no matter what type of lens you're looking at it through, even if you're a startup business owner and you're trying to connect with the media and you have a really amazing founding story and you just haven't had the opportunity to get on a platform and, and pitch yourself or share yourself, Social media is a great way to do that. I, I can't tell you how many times personally I've pitched for People Magazine, Good Morning America, you know, News 12, New Jersey. It really doesn't matter the platform. My firm has gotten hits for social. So, sorry. I, I think no. one of the things, if I can just jump in here too, is yeah. there's a high, a high level of accessibility and a reasonably low cost. I mean, you, you, you can pay to promote things on social media, but there's also this organic aspect to it that can make it, I, I think, cost effective for uh, entrepreneurs and small businesses to really get out there and reach a target audience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I would say, you know, obviously the the model changes, you know, it's it's how they kind of fish us in. So I remember when Facebook started and it was like kind of this free organic wild, wild west. And then, you know, same thing with Instagram. It started like free and organic advertising, but that's where they get you, right? They, they get you sucked in into this world. And then it changes from a free organic model to a now kind of pay per play, which I'm kind of sad because I wish Instagram kind of would have stayed in that space a little longer. Like the algorithm has changed tremendously over the last like year and a half. And like what you were able to get to go viral, right? From a content standpoint, it's a little trickier now because it's now a paid model versus a organic model. I feel still, still feel that like uh, Instagram has more of a um, organic approach than Facebook, right? You'll notice that posts don't go as far. You'll notice that, you know, you don't get as many likes. And that's when you can tell that it's transitioned into this like full on paid model, but there's a little bit more freedom. I still feel on IG, if you can figure out how to get the algorithm to work for you and hashtags to work for you, it's a little bit easier of a use and more business friendly if you're not trying to buy a bunch of ads. So, um, so I guess yeah, there's different platforms that we're all familiar with, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn. What are some of the better, what kinds of businesses do better on each of these platforms? I mean, how do you go about deciding what platforms you should be on? Mm -hmm. I think it's based on your demographic who you need to reach, right? So if you're looking to reach, I would say a little bit of an older demographic, Facebook is probably gonna be like a great place for you, for your brand and for your business. I would say if you're looking to, you know, reach a Gen Zer or a millennial, like, you know, obviously, you know, I think Instagram is a really good place for that. And then if, you know, you're looking to reach, I forget the group of kids after that, but I know my daughter's one of them, a TikToker, <laughs> right? Like, you know, that's really going to be where you're going to hit that 18 to 34 year old, because, you know, that's their, what I like to call MTV, right? Of their generation uh, is TikTok. So I, I think it just depends on the demographic that you're trying to reach. Uh, that's interesting. So you don't think that the product or service type really plays a big role in that. So I always thought, you know, Instagram was like a very visual uh, platform. Uh, LinkedIn is sort of more professional service. <laughs> Do you think that those factors play into which platforms you should be selecting or? It does, but I also think because video is king right now that, and you can use video across all those platforms that, you know, it doesn't make a huge difference. I think if you can narrow down like who you specifically want to go after from a target perspective, that is the value. And then you can always, depending on like whatever the content piece is going to be, just, you know, be able to layer in video because right now we're seeing video as being the best way to get your product out there, even over like traditional static posts that don't work as well anymore on any of those platforms. And then TikTok, forget it. It has to be video. Yeah, well, something. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add to that. And I would say something that we always recommend, um, you know, when I'm working with clients is you'll see tons of articles be released. This changes constantly. Something that I would tell you to follow a year ago, I would not tell you to follow, you know, present day because 
the model of, of how they're pumping out the information and the way that the algorithm is working is constantly changing every single day. But something that you sh I would encourage you not to get caught up in is thinking specifically that Facebook is only for a certain demographic or TikTok is only for a certain demographic, because I do agree with what Kenya is saying, but there's also the side of it where I would encourage you to do an in-depth look at who you're trying to reach and how you're trying to reach them and why you're trying to reach them through your business needs. Because, you know, a lot of people would say soccer moms are on Facebook, but there is an entire grouping of soccer moms that are dedicated and very much on TikTok as well. And so it's about figuring out how to find who it is you're trying to target and reach and do it in, an, in a unique perspective. Just because you launch on TikTok or just because you launch on Instagram and, and that's where your demographic is, it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you post, you're going to get that engagement. <laughs> Engagement's really, really important. So figuring out and measuring what's working, what's not. It's a lot of data that goes into this. And one mistake business owners will make is that they'll, you know, they'll oh. boost a post or they'll throw some money into ad spend and they don't understand why they're only having a few likes on their page. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but there are definitely ways to figure out what works best for you. There's no magical time to post. There's no magical day to post. It, it's really determined by project and, and what it is that you're trying to do with the page. So how does a new entrepreneur who is just coming into um, their business, I mean, sometimes it's really clear who their target market is, but sometimes it's it's not because you, you think you have a target market, but it turns out your real market is over here. Uh, how, do, how does somebody who's trying to figure out this golden target market that marketers are always talking about, um, identify it, right? And identify it at an early stage. I think you have to really understand your audience, you know, and I'll go back to Tara's soccer mom example. Like, you know, the soccer mom is not necessarily going to be, you know, a 55 plus year old, right? A soccer mom could be a young mom that's 18 to 44, right? So then it would make sense for you to be on a TikTok and it would make sense for you to be on an Instagram based on the age of that demographic. So I think like when you have a thorough understanding of how old the person is that you need to go after, what their behavioral interests are. I think digitally we have the advantage now because we can in real time see what people are buying, right? With on Amazon and we have all this data now, like, you know, where they are in the buying cycle of uh, what they're getting for their household. So just knowing what behaviors are there from a consumption standpoint, where are they spending the most time? Um, you know, how are they accessing content? What are they engaging with? Like, you know, so I think having a thorough understanding of like what their behaviors are really will help give you some great insights into, you know, how you need to best approach them. And then that's what's going to help you if you are placing an ad buy or, you know, you need to reach a specific target, be more efficient in that process. Yeah. And, and to go off of that as well, being flexible, because like we've been saying since the beginning, this information is going to change over time. Your audience very well can change over time too. That might sound strange, but the truth is a lot of you might be adding new products to your lineup, or you might be kicking off a different type of ad campaign or marketing campaign or PR campaign. And so every time you make a switch in your business, any strategy related to the decisions you make need to be accounted for as well. Yeah. And I would just add one more thing to that. You Understanding your insights is, is really key. So under every social media platform that you're on, you have an account, right? There is an insight tab, which I encourage everybody to go to if you've never visited, right? You need to know who your audience is. Like I know my audience is women 18 to 44. They're moms, they're active, I know that they have a certain type of lifestyle in terms of like, maybe they're working out, they're wearing a certain clothing. Like I know exactly who I'm talking to when I post. So I try to make sure that I post things that speak specifically to those audiences. Um, I know where most of my audience comes from. Most of my audience comes from New York, the New York area. I have some people on the West coast that engage with my platform. So just understanding like who you're talking to really helps you grow your channel because then you can better serve them with content that makes the most sense, right? And, and it, it even shows you like a pie chart of like, 
how many men are there, how many women are there, right? So you can kind of really see who, what the balance is, right? So I think knowing the more insights you understand about like who you're actually speaking to is going to help you grow your channels and your platforms and be just super, super, um, just effective when it comes to the content that you're putting out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I would also say for any business owners, it's a delicate balance to when it comes to creating content. And some of you might even be thinking, what does it even mean to create content? So if we take a step back and think about what content even is, it's it's your portfolio, it's your grid on Instagram, it's either the, the photos or the videos, um, the pictures, the testimonials, um, you know, samples of how your product or service might even work. That's your content. And so switching up your content and, and measuring what's performing, what's not performing, but being very mindful of not having everything be a product push because that can also turn people away. Or if you're too heavy um, on the side of promoting the product where you're just showing it or you're saying how much it costs or you're demonstrating it, but you're not really explaining it, that's hard too. So one thing I would say is go back to your roots, go back to the origin. Why did you create this? What is the inspiration? How can other people relate to your story or your roots? That's a way to grab a customer's attention. And that's a way to build a supportive, interactive, engaging social media audience. Yeah. And I, and I think I'm glad that Tara brought that up as a point, because like, I think like really being able to demonstrate your value proposition from not just the you know, a laundry list of this is what I do. And this is what I, I sell. Like, I don't know if you remember that George Carlin skit back in the day where he would get on stage and he would like do the whole laundry list of like all these things that are available in like a commercial that you hear, right? You're shoving everything that you do into 60 seconds, where if you take a step back, right? And maybe there's some research or there's some value add, like there, there's something that you can tell story-wise, right? That gives you an opportunity to promote your product, but also provides value for the person that's consuming the content that's there is a good way to just to not sell, to sell, but not sell, if that makes any sense. So let's suppose that I am uh, an entrepreneur, a solopreneur, right? And my resources are, I'm stretched thin because in terms of money and, and, and time. So what can I do to have a social media presence that would be effective for my business, but still, you know, re- respect some of the constraints that I'm operating under? Mm-hmm. I mean, you see this little thing here, this little gadget we have, it's like this little mini computer <laughs> that we carry with us everywhere. It's got a camera in it, right? right. And and a video camera. And I'd say, you know, any opportunity that you can take to create 60 seconds of something, right? You know, maybe you're telling a story about your product. Maybe you're creating a quick testimonial where you're recording someone who's used your product. Things like that are cheap and cost efficient and it's, it looks organic and it, that's what works well on social media, right? People want real authentic experiences. So creating a testimonial, right? With your, your, camera phone, right? Of somebody who's had a really good experience with your business or your brand is something that you could post and it will be, and it's helpful. And it's right. And it's you, it's someone telling the story for you. There's a great quote by uh, Jeffrey Gittimer. It's in the little red book of selling. When, when you speak about yourself, it's bragging, but when somebody else speaks about you, it's the truth, right? Um. So anything that you can create um, that's authentic and has some meat to it works super well on social media. And you can do that super cheap by just creating content from your phone. I had some amazing advice. I mean, it's kind of right there in front of our face, but uh, actually hearing you suggest it makes a a lot of sense. Tara, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you just explained is something that a lot of customers end up coming to us, my my team, and they say, I'm overwhelmed. I'm an entrepreneur. I wear, you know, 57 different hats. We can all relate to it. You're caught up in so many different day-to-day responsibilities, especially if you're the one running the company, the inventor, the entrepreneur, however you label yourselves. And the one thing I always say is pick one platform. And that might sound strange, but I mean, if you're the one that's controlling it, you don't have the ability to have a team to, to rely on and, and to yes, support. Uh, pick one platform and 
get a handle on that, get a grasp on that and launch it and then slowly add on. I don't mean like only make TikTok your only platform for years and years and years, but especially in the beginning, it's easy as experts to come up here and say, you have to do X, Y, Z on Twitter and X, Y, Z on Instagram and X, Y, Z on, it, it's very overwhelming, especially when your plate is already, you know, overflowing. So pick one thing, get an understanding of that, find a real connection, make a real connection to your audience and then continue to grow. And, and currently I have clients that are killing it on TikTok or they're killing it on Instagram. And that is where they put the majority of their energy. And that is where the majority of their sales are coming from. And it's not to say that they don't have a LinkedIn or they don't have a Facebook, but for them, what we've found is that that is their home base. Like that, that is where they are excelling the most. And so that is where we're investing the, the most amount of attention and energy. Mm -hmm. And I would say here's another free hack, right? Understanding hashtags is like super key if you want to push anything on social media. And that's a free way of not having to place an ad buy, right? So the algor algorithm works on hashtags, right? And I would say one mistake that a lot of people make is they put a million hashtags up there. Like it's hashtag 100 things. Pick two to three, at most four hashtags that are relevant to your product, your business or service, right? Because that is how the discoverability happens, right? That's how Instagram finds stuff. That's how YouTube finds stuff. That's how Facebook, it's like, it's like the yellow pages on steroids, right? It's, it's basically how SEO works, right? Same situation. So the more uh, concentrated you are and the better hashtags that you pick, that's what's going to make it go. Right. And once it's, it's all about like timing versus like hitting the algorithm at the, at the perfect moment. If you have the right hashtag, you post at the right time, which you can find that in your insights, Instagram, especially will give you the best in, uh, times a day for your particular page when your page is getting the most engagement, right? I know on Tuesday at 3 PM is a good time to post based on the insights in my profile, right? So it's the right hashtag knowing what time to post based on the insights that are in your profile. And that's the formula for getting something to go and it's free. Right. And so it's so. not just a matter of just tossing it out there. Uh, at, at any given time. time. No, it's gotta be purposeful. That's, that's the thing. And you'll see some people who say, Oh, you got to post a million times a day. I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, I've had experiences where I've posted one good piece of content and it's, you know, gotten thousands and thousands and thousands of views, right? So it's all just about like the hitting the the algorithm at the right time of day, right? And and just the the content being purposeful. I I see a hand. So, well, um, so uh, I, we'll we'll go to questions. I just want to ask one more question myself, and then I'd like uh, you know, David and Elizabeth uh, also to chime in with a few questions before we get to. Uh, our our audience questions, but what if you're the type of person who really doesn't feel comfortable being on video, right? Or even doesn't even feel comfortable like putting their thoughts and opinions out there to the world. Um, and that, now maybe you're saying, well, maybe you shouldn't be an entrepreneur in that case. But there are a lot of people with good ideas, um, but maybe they're a little on the shy side. Uh, they're in some way self conscious. I mean, what kind of advice do you give to them uh, to 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 kind of get out there and do something? Or are there things they can do that don't necessarily involve them personally, like yeah. cell phone video? Learn how to make a reel, right? You don't have to necessarily show yourself on a, on a, on a social media reel. There's tutorials on YouTube that show you how to make effective reels where it could just be your voice, Right. It, you can even use a robotic voice that they have. Like you can literally go in and make a reel and type everything you want to say. And it, the, the reel will take it and turn it into someone else's voice. You can add your other imagery. It doesn't have to be you, right? It could be, there's other ways of telling your message if you don't feel comfortable getting on camera or, you know, cracking a mic. So you Google or YouTube how to make a Instagram reel and that'll like save you from the fear of having to get on camera and still give you the same impact. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Aside, aside from posting, which again, this might sound strange if you guys aren't thinking 
from the same perspective, but this is why we have these classes, right? So aside from actually posting the content, there's a whole other side of Instagram that's going to help you drive traffic to your website or to get your click rate higher and higher and higher. And that's like the back end of things. And I'm not even talking about it from like an advertising ad spend um, perspective. Let's go back to hashtags. Kenya brought that up earlier. Um, it's not about just using the hashtags. It's about exploring the hashtags, right? So do a deep dive on Instagram or, or whatever your platform is that you're most comfortable with or you're starting to experiment with. And you'll find people that are using hashtags that maybe are most relevant to your business or most relevant to your demographic or your target or whatever it is that you're searching for at the time. And then those are your people. Those are your potential customers. Those are your potential followers. Now you can engage with them. And so a lot of business owners that don't want to be as involved or cannot be as involved from you know, a creation standpoint for whatever the reason a lot of times they find success in doing it in a different type of way because engagement is really important. So they're the ones that are, you know, ground roots, getting in, clicking on the hashtags, connecting with these people, leaving a comment, sending a DM. Now, of course, you know, it's 2023. There are bots that do these types of things. There are uh, companies that you can hire to do these types of things, but it's still, although it's still very much a grassroots time consuming way to build, it's still a way to build and it works. And there have been tons of studies done that show that it works. I've seen tons of clients know that it works. I've worked with celebrities and it works. They have a whole team of people doing it, but even from a very small grassroots standpoint, that's what works. People want to have that engagement. You show them support. They show you support in return. And so you follow them. They'll follow you. There's got to be, it's got to be reciprocated. That's one way to look at it. I'm not in any way encouraging that to be your only soul model, because that would be a very, very long time to, to get you where you need to be in your business, but it's just one avenue that can be taken. Yeah. I would say too, that to break it down a little further, you know, there's no shame in following, you know, the Damon Johns of the world and the folks of the world that are already doing what you're doing in a similar space. So if you have like a celebrity or a, an influencer, right, that has a similar connection or um, brand, right, or product that you're already in that space, following them and then looking at like the hashtags that they're using, right, to make things go is going to help you tremendously, right? And there's no shame in that. There's nothing new under the sun, right? They've, to be quite honest, they've probably followed someone and have used the same tactic, right? So it's, again, it's just making sure that you're discoverable, right? As much as possible. And and I call it a swagger jack, but there's nothing wrong with swagger jacking a hashtag that someone's already using effectively that has a massive platform that they've already built. So that works for sure. Very good. David. First of all, hi, Kenya. Like, hi. Hi, Tara. <laughs> good to see both of you. Um, I, so they say often that, uh, you know, bad press is good press, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about like what makes bad social media, right? Because it's not all like, you know, fun and games, you know, you, there's, you know, you have to be PC in the world. There's different things are taboo from your experiences. I'd love to hear like, what should people not be doing? You know, arguing in the comments, yes. <laughs> seriously. And I, we had a, um, an incident recently. I won't get into the details of it, but it was a pretty high profile situation and dis difference of agreement. Right. And you know, you have some pretty high profile people that are involved. There's, they have big platforms. Someone says something, somebody chimes in the chat. And then it's just like this explosion of back and forth. And then the blogs start picking it up. And it's like, it was bad press and it got, but it got a lot of visibility and pushed a lot of um, traction to these particular platforms, but it just looked messy from a brand perspective. Right. So I think there is such a thing as bad press if it's going to compromise the integrity of your brand. Right. Because it's really something that could have worked from a bad press perspective. But what made it bad is someone hopping in the comments and it got escalated to a whole nother level. So I would just say stay out of your feelings and stay out of the comment section when it comes to social media. Got it. 
Sarah, what, what, what about you? I think that's an interesting question from David. Like, what <laughs> yes. don't you do? Right. Yes. So I don't know if anybody watches Real Housewives of I any do. franchise, but I work <laughs> with a lot of the girls. So again, this is from a reality TV standpoint, but this happens constantly, constantly. I can't even tell you specific examples, but if you watch the show, you definitely know. So for one, one of the things ethically we think about all the time is how do we how do we manage crisis or how do we tackle this situation? And a lot of times there's very strong opinions around this. One side will say, delete it. One side will say, own it. I really do think it depends on what is being said and how the communication is happening. But as a publicist, I definitely don't agree that all press is, or all, bad press is good press, any press is good press. That is definitely not true. But it, it really does come down to how you're spinning it or how you're going to find a solution through it. Because you can't just brush everything under the rug and you can't just make an apology statement and it's going to be fine. Um, that's, that's in an extreme way of kind of looking at it. But to Kenya's point, it is true. A lot of times you'll see people actually start an argument in the comments and it is a very negative thing. And you don't want to look like you are promoting that or you are saying, hey, that's okay. And this is what our brand agrees with, even if it has nothing to do with you. So we've seen a lot of times this is happening and you think that you're not, it's, it might not turn into something, but it could explode. Anything you ever leave anywhere, comment wise or other, it's not going anywhere. It's in the internet. It's, it's never, just because you delete it, it doesn't go away. So that is also something to be very mindful of. Um, and it's true too, from a PR standpoint, when you're trying to tell your story and you're trying to get press out there, you know, media is going to do a deep dive on you. They're going to look you up. They're going to dig things up. They're going to look at your Instagram. They're going to look at your TikTok. They're going to look at your LinkedIn. They're going to see things. Okay. It's not the case for every kind of piece, but we've had in-depth Forbes features come out about our clients and they do a deep dive and they found things and things have to be addressed. So that's also something to think about too. You might think that your personal social media doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the business side of what you're doing, but they are all relevant and they're all very much connected. I know that some companies, for example, use social media as a second background check, right? You yeah, know? it's true. And, and yeah. so whatever you say lives on forever. Uh, we yeah. at one of our Passage to Profit episodes, um, which you can you can download the podcast anywhere you get the podcast, passagetoprofitshow.com. Uh, go to our website, a uh, little commercial there. But um, we had a, uh, we, we, we did a segment, IP in the news segment on M&M and the Real Housewives of, who was it? I think it was Maryland or something like that. Um, and they had trademarked this uh, fr phrase, or they were trying to trademark this phrase, reasonably shady. And I guess Eminem, who I don't really know that much about, was like using the character Slim Shady, right? And so he challenged the trademark. And you you kind of half wonder, I, I, are they doing this for the publicity? Are they getting into a fight about this just to kind of get some press? about this or is this something you know or is this like uh, a, a legitimate uh you know business issue and it's it, looking at it for me i kind of found it hard to see it as a legitimate business issue it seemed more like a publicity ploy i mean do people do that oh yeah every day are you kidding? yeah <laughs> yeah, I can't confirm or deny that one for you, Richard, but I know this the is, answer. This is the this is the the era of clout chasing, as I like to call it. So unfortunately, people re will resort to negative things, right, to create uh, an opportunity for them to have visibility, um, help resurrect their career, whatever. People get very petty and very shady. Uh, at a moments of desperation. So to answer your question, it's yes, unfortunately. Okay. So, so anyway, but that kind of goes with the bad press question, right? Because, um, you know, I mean, did the Real Housewives intentionally pick this or uh, were they kind of provoking a fight? Was Eminem being unreasonably sensitive? Um well, whatever it is, we, you know, we're talking about it now and we talked about it on the radio show. So uh, I guess they achieved their 
uh, objective, right? Elizabeth, uh, did you have a question or, or for the media team here? I do. So I have a little story to go with it. But years ago, we had people trying to convince us to advertise the law firm on Facebook. And all I knew about Facebook was that somebody we know who shall not remain mentioned had something really disgusting happen to their foot and posted it all over Facebook. And so I was oh, like, yeah. I'm like, that's what's on Facebook. Why My sister-in-law did this. Yes. Yes. Why yeah, would you... yeah, it was awful. You know? Why would you put a business in a place where somebody's showing this damaged foot? And all that's changed now. That was a few years ago, right? So I'm just wondering if you're trying to go business to business, for instance, or business to consumer, what is the best site to use? There's so many of them. So I, I guess I'm really focused right now on business to business. Where is there a site now that's standing out from the others as the best place to be? Well, I think from a paid ad perspective, you know, you can do, you know, you, B2B works well on across the mall, right? Because you can, like when you're doing a, a boosted post, right? You can cl click who you want your target to be and they give you options for B2B. So I don't think there's anyone that really differentiates. I think um, if you're organically trying to do it, it gets a little trickier, but again, that's where the content play comes in. That's where the hashtag play comes in. Uh, and that's gonna help you kind of like narrow it down on like, who's gonna pick it up. So for example, right? If you're trying to reach other entrepreneurs, you, you know, you might use hashtag entrepreneurs. You might use um, hashtag intellectual property. Like you just wanna make sure that you're, narrowing it down enough well you don't want it to be too niche either right because then there may be a very small following of that hashtag right and how you know here's a little trick too if you don't know this already when you go up to put a hashtag in for example in the little search bar like when you're you know you're posting it'll show you the number of uh post right that are affiliated with that particular hashtag what I try to do is go with obviously the higher number, you know, and sometimes depending on the hashtag, it's not as high, but typically any like hashtag that has, you know, I would say 5,000 or plus post or 10,000 or plus post associated with it is a good threshold of like that could potentially help, you know, connect to the algorithm a little um, faster or a little better. Sometimes it's less than that. It just depends. But um, that will give you an indication of how many people are actually engaging with those particular hashtags and, you know, kind of help you um, have a little gauge there in terms of who you're talking to. So you could maybe do the same post across Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, maybe even TikTok, although I don't know what's going to happen with TikTok now. Um, and then I, just see which one is best, right? Well, I, and I also think con content has to be different across different platforms. Like I don't, I wouldn't necessarily post the same thing to IG. Like I think IG and TikTok coincide very well with each other because you have reels and you have, you know, like you have the whole um, video thing and, and the algorithms are similar. I don't necessarily know that that same content would work on a Facebook or a LinkedIn, like it's just, you have to know who you're talking to and how they're gonna resonate with it. So I don't believe in there's a one size fits all when it comes to content and posting. I think different things work for different platforms. That's great. So Tara, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I definitely agree with there's no one size fits all model. Something that I would recommend and all of you guys can do this is really start to pay attention and, and measure like, write out what is performing, what's not performing. And it doesn't matter if you only have three likes on a post or you have 3000 likes on the post, because there's a reason why one piece of content has more attention. Maybe it has a lot of comments. Maybe it has a lot of likes. Maybe you notice that when you posted something, that something got a lot of people to send you a DM or that something on that particular time uh, drove a lot of traffic to your website. So really start to pay attention uh, do that for at least like a month to two months. So you have something to compare to one another. And I always suggest that too, before you start dumping a lot of money into ad spend. A lot of times um, people are just kind of saying, oh, I'll boost this for $20 or I'll throw 50 bucks into this or, hey, it's only five bucks. Let me do that. And it seems like not a lot of money. And then it adds up very, very, very quickly. And it really isn't helping you if you're not measuring anything. Like if you're just throwing content out there and then you're just making something different and something, but you're not comparing anything. There's no data. Like it's, you're just kind of wasting your time if I'm, if I'm being straight and I'm being honest. So 
there's nothing more frustrating than not really understanding it, but, but putting so much time and energy into it, or even working with someone and they're putting so much time and energy into it, and you're just not seeing results. There has to be a way, there's got to be a reason for why it's not performing. So Mm -hmm. unless you're measuring it, you're really not going to know. Yeah. And what you like is not what necessarily everybody else is going to like. Right. And, And I've had this with posts sometimes too. I'll be like, oh, I thought that would was so cool and it would just go so well. And it would be like the the thing that I would not think was the cool thing that would get more engagement, like, you know, post-wise. So it's like, try to take yourself out of like what you think is cool or whatever. And like what you feel is going to be a value to the people that you're talking to. Cause that's, what's going to like go the furthest. And just to Tara's point, like, so every post that you put up, Again, you can go into insights. It'll tell you the impressions. It'll tell you how many people you reach. It'll tell you the likes, like, and it'll, like, it'll give you a full scale of like the peaks and the valleys of like, compared to all of your other posts for that particular week. So paying attention to those insights is going to tell you like, what's a value to your audience and like, what is not. And again, what you think is cool is not necessarily what other people perceive as being interesting. So. Well, should all the posts be video posts or can you do a combination? I think you probably have to have a visual with every post, right? But can you go back and forth between static and video posts? I think with pictures, it's okay. I think pictures work well. Um, I, I, I'm not a big fan of static posts. I mean, unless it's something earth shattering, like, you know, where you could, um, you could like set it up where it's a multiple post. So, so you know, when you post to Instagram, you can add mul- multiple subsets to whatever the visual is, right? If mm-hmm. it's a how to guide to something and you have multiple like layers to it or multiple um, visuals to it, then I think that works well if you're teaching somebody how to do it. Like, so for example, like the five steps to, I don't know, peeling a potato. And it's like step slide one is step one, slide two is step. I think those work well, but if you're just throwing up some random stat or some random thing like yeah I think back in the day when Instagram first started like you could people be like oh that's cool like but now people are so visual and so inundated with all these other external things like to get their attention I feel like it's got to be really of value if it's a static post video obviously has been the way to go as of late so let me ask if you're uh, you know Tara touched on the subject of advertising and promoting posts if you're a solopreneur, small business, um, you're trying to decide where to put your ad spend, how much of your marketing budget do you think you should put into social as opposed to maybe pay-per-click or other types of uh, advertising? Well, I think the golden rule with advertising overall marketing, I think it's like 10 to 15% of your revenue right? It, you should dedicate to your overall marketing budget. I would say for a good media mix, um, maybe allocating, like if you're doing, if you have 15% or you're doing 20%, maybe 10% of that goes to, to a good digital advertising strategy. I would say at least five to seven and a half percent, right? If you're not at the the higher percentage threshold, just because t- talk, talking about your overall revenue or correct, correct. Okay. Yes, correct. So, you know, and it all depends, like everybody's situation is, is different. Right. Um, but I, w- I'm always about being purposeful with any kind of advertising dollars. So, and I'll give you my rule for radio. And I think it applies to, you know, anything you do digitally or on social as well, find a way to own an audience. Right. So if you have to pick a, a thing, right? And it's only one channel to focus on and you can place advertising dollars there and have ownership of that audience, like getting in front of them frequently, um, you know, making sure there's like a multi um, touch point to what you're doing in terms of content. That is always the golden rule. I tell people that even when it comes to radio, you want to reach as many people as many times as you can. And I think the same thing applies with social media if they see you the more they see you the more touch points there are once they get to that action phase of the buying cycle and they know like and trust you and they know what you do before they need you you're gold so just find an audience that you can own efficiently yeah to add on that I would definitely say you know there's a side to social media where you don't have to advertise 
Now, the majority of our clients do advertise, but it's a, it's a delicate balance, but you don't have to advertise because there's also a bunch that don't. So for example, if you put a campaign into motion and part of your campaign or part of your strategy is you have a product, right? Uh, let's pretend it's a, a, a dog brand. It's a new dog treat that just came out to the market. One of the first things that I would recommend that you do is launch an ambassador program. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's essentially grouping together a bunch of pet parents or pet experts, veterinarians, et cetera, and so on. They could be, you know, uh, micro influencers or they could be mega ones. If you're, if, you're not, if you're not paying the influencers, which you don't have to do all the time, there's ways to get around that as well. You can have them endorse your product, but there's got to be something in it for them. So if you are a startup and you're just starting out and you're connecting with a grouping of people who want product in exchange, right? That is one way to go about it. There's also a whole other side of social where you could be collaborating with other creators and you can do a giveaway. And so I'm using these examples because sometimes I've seen clients who don't have the largest following do a giveaway with the brand that is pretty significant because it's all in the pitch and the story and the way you approach them, um, contacts, relationships, all that. And now you're on their page, maybe you have 2000 followers and this brand has over you know, 25,000 followers and you're doing a holiday giveaway or whatever the theme is. And now their audience is getting access to your audience. So I just think that there's a way to think about your strategy, how you go into things where everything, it, it's not very black and white. It doesn't have to be ads or organic. There are other methods, modalities that you can connect with other collaborators, um, do other things on social to get your product out there, but always think, you know, how is this going to be mutually beneficial? Because you can't just reach out to a celebrity or some kind of giant TikTok star and just assume that they're going to get your product and then share it. It's the same thing in PR. We work with a ton of authors. Okay. You know, we send media packages out all the time. Some of them we have relationships with, so they will post about someone who maybe isn't well known, but other times you can't just expect that you're going to send Taylor Swift a package and she's going to post about it. It's just not going to happen. So you have to know your audience and, and, and think about it from a different perspective. That would be, that would be my two cents. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of add on that a little bit, you know, just be leery too. Cause I, I think we all went through this influencer phenomenon a few years ago where everything was like influencers, 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 which is awesome. But I, what I would say is just make sure that whoever you're using from an influencer perspective has real reach and real followers, right? There's a lot of fake pages. There's a lot of bots. There's a lot of pay, you know, bought followers. Like the last thing you want to do is put your brand or your product in the hands of somebody who really doesn't have the engagement that you think that they have. So I always say a good rule is, you know, someone who is a micro influencer, typically a micro influencer has anywhere from like 10 to, I would say 50,000 followers. And then you have like a medium influencer where it's a little higher. Those are honestly better than the millions and millions and millions of followers that you see a lot of times on these big accounts, because Nine times out of 10, a lot of those pages are not necessarily authentic in that the followers are real or, you know, I, like, I think in the beginning, especially with Instagram, everybody wanted that little blue check, right? And that was like super important to them. Now you'll notice that there's a subscription now for the blue check where before you had to like go to Instagram, get approved, get verified, right? And when you were verified, it meant something. Now everybody can get the blue check. So it, to me, it, it kind of takes away from that. But I say all that to say is that just be leery of what you think looks grandiose and great from people who have all these gazillions of followers because you want to pay attention to the comments. You want to pay attention to people real people commenting in the section comment section, not bots. If you see a lot of bots in someone's comment, get out of there because nine times out of 10, they've got paid followers and it's just not a real page. So I, I say all that to say that. So, so let me, uh, by the way, uh, if you have questions that you'd like to direct to Tara or uh, to Kenya or, uh, you know, David or myself, uh, please feel free to use the chat, or I guess you can also raise your hand. Is that right? Um, and so 
Uh, if you do have questions, go ahead and start putting them in. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And there is no such thing as a, as a bad question. As a matter of fact, there's Paulina. Paulina, welcome to the ESS. Oh, hi. How's it going? Hi, fine. How are you, Mr. Gearhart? Good I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to say it, so I'm just going to say it. So I have friends who have large followings and they would like to share my business, but sometimes some of those people have questionable, questionable uh, pages. <laughs> what do you guys think, uh, Tara and um, Kenya? Hey, Kenya. Hey, Tara. Hi, Paulina. <laughs> Hi. Hi. And um, I just want to know what you guys think about having them actually post something about your business that's my question so let me let, take it down a step further so when you say they have things up on their page that aren't a good representation of your brand is that what you're saying or yeah like protecting your brand or they might have like a only fans or something like you know what I mean? like something like you know just kind of questionable i mean they have large followings but I, did, I, I guess it depends on what you're actually selling or you want them to promote, I guess. I'm not sure. That's my question. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, my rule with that, and I think in anything in life is like representation is like super important when it comes to your brand. And like, I think you, it's important to align with platforms and people that sh kind of share your same beliefs and like your, your same values for like your product or your brand. So if you are feeling that something's not in alignment or it could be compromising, you're probably right. And you probably shouldn't, even though they have this massive following and you could probably somebody find somebody who has a smaller following that is more in line with your brand values that, that, so it, that's, could be just as effective, right? And you don't have to, you don't have to compromise. So that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, I would say a hundred percent. And the other thing is just because, you know, let's say they have a million followers, are those million followers your target, right? So just because they share something, this is the thing people think just because a celebrity or whoever shares something, oh, my thing's going to blow up. Well, not necessarily because who's following that, right? And mm -hmm. so it's a hundred percent accurate to say that you could have a page that has 5,000 followers, but if they are your exact target, that's 5,000 opportunities for you to make a connection or a sale. So mm -hmm. look into that as well. I wouldn't, I wouldn't let the number um, grab your attention. I, I would, I would do some digging. Yeah, I, I, I agree too. And that's a good point about like the numbers, right? Like if 10% of their audience came and did business with you and they only had 5,000 followers, would you be happy? Um, five, well, right now, yes. But <laughs> other than that, no. But well, yeah, well, I right mean, initially, now, right? Like, and yes. I tell this, yeah. So that's why it, it's not always about the number. It's it's the mm. quality of who you're reaching. Gotcha. Very, very good. Thank you. So I, thank you, Paulina. I'm going to go to uh, Stephen Dick because he had his hand up before. Um, Stephen? Hey, everybody. How are we doing today? Uh, we're Good. doing great. Good. Thanks how are for you? joining us. Yeah, it's great to be here. Cool. It's, uh, it's, it's some, some great content you got going on. So thanks for, thanks for all the advice. It's fantastic. Um, I just want to ask a quick question of, of your opinions on something. Um, through reading articles, and um, I'm in marketing, so I kind of look at things a little bit, especially analytical and everything else. There's a big conversation going on now where uh, people are discussing, do you class it as social media or is it now classed as performance media? Um, you know, because a lot of people out there just do it, you know, I just do it for the likes and I just want to get the sponsorships, like the, all the influencers are going that way. Businesses are just doing it because they want people to call up whatever else. So are you literally just at this point performing or are you still, you know, social media was originally designed to engage people with one another, to start conversations, to build a better world in theory. Um, obviously, the wonderful world of trolls kind of changes that. But I'm just kind of curious on your your opinions of that kind of um, that kind of discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely more performance driven now, especially as you know, smaller creators right, have learned how to leverage the space and monetize their content. I mean, when you can figure out that, like, you could post a 60 second or a 90 second reel, and now Instagram will pay you, right? Same, similar to the YouTube model. 
for, you know, your viewership. I mean, that like to me, it's a no, it's a no brainer. And, you know, it's cool to use it for social socialization. I, again, I think that it's, it's still a little bit of both, but I think it's definitely, definitely leaning more towards a performance model and that it's given, you know, creators of any level, right. The opportunity to now make money and, you know, leverage their content and, and monetize. So that's my two cents. Yeah, I would say don't lose sight of the beliefs of your own company, right? So relationship building is really important. Um, whatever your values are, don't lose sight of that. So if you're using social, obviously, um, if you're a startup or a brand, you're using it because you want to drive sales or whatever it is. That's all well and good, but also make sure you're still engaging. If someone's leaving comments on your page, if you don't have time to respond to them, hire someone to do it because all that stuff really matters. And it and it's a part of your, your interaction with your customers. Um, without your customers and your followers, you would have nothing. And so I feel like sometimes that can get lost, especially when companies grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So just remember that. Yeah, that, that's a good point about the comments. So that's kind of one of my pet peeves. Like when I see all these comments and someone's, you know, post and like, no one took the time to go in and say, mm -hmm. thank you. Or, I mean, and sometimes it, it can be a little rigorous, right. Depending on how many you're getting, Definitely. but yeah. like taking the time, like to like it or hit the heart, or I think people want to feel important. Right. And like, in terms of building your brand and like keeping a loyal following, like making sure people feel connected to you and that you appreciate that they took the time to give you a compliment is important. Yeah. That sounds like that sounds like great advice. And uh it, it best the best business is about good relationships, absolutely. Yeah. But Paul Ray, uh thank you for joining us. Do you have a question? Um, I do, yeah. Or a comment. Yeah, mm -hmm. a question actually, yeah. Um, so and this this I how would you handle a situation where you have a very large uh, age demographic? So my my target market is only a million people in the U.S. in total. So um, sort of dropping out, you know, different age brackets, I think, would take a, a big hit to uh, our potential market. Plus, I've seen people engaging. Um, it's a very very niche area. So I see people engaging from you know 18, well actually 13, all the way up to you know 75 plus. Um, so I know we have engagement across the board. Um, you know, IG appears to be 18 to 70 plus. Um, Facebook is kind of 35 to 70 plus. Um, you know, what what would you do in that scenario? Before you guys answer, Paul, can you tell us a little bit about your business, just so we have some context? Yeah, so it's a medical device. It's targeting people with ostomies, um, ileostomies and colostomies. Um, we're basically making an air vent to allow those people to release gas from their bag. Typically, it, the bag will balloon. It um, becomes uncomfortable under, under clothing, could even actually cause the bag to pop off their body. So um, we've had a lot of good responses from people when we talk about this. Um, and again, across the entire age bracket, not just one demographic. Right. I yeah. mean... Yeah. The first thing I think about is I don't know a lot about the condition that you just mentioned. Matter of fact, I've never heard of it before. So I think anything that you can do from an educational standpoint, right, on statistics or like stories or things of that nature that can give you, you know, give uh, um, audiences that value add is super because then it's like, well, I never heard of this. Oh, and what is it? And then, then you have an opportunity to talk about your product in a very organic way without putting it front and centers. And I think that will also help you reach that. You have a, you have a huge range in terms of like demographically who you're hitting. Yeah. So education is always like, I think going to be the, the play because people love information. They love to learn. And if you can, you know, help them in that space, I think that's a good strategy. Okay. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mean, yeah, I mean, hearing about bags popping off is is freaky deaky. So I, <laughs> yeah. there's definitely a need there. Yeah. Yeah. And you can customize the content too. So if you're going with an educational approach, and you know that on certain platforms, you know this is the range, and then on another platform, this is the range. Create different types of content that would meet the needs um, after you go through the test market phase to that audience. And then that way you're reinforcing the same messaging, but you're doing it in different ways and you'll be able to see what's performing the best. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Evelyn, uh, welcome to the ESS. What, uh, what, do you, what is your question? 
Okay. So um, I do get most of my business through social media. I do custom playroom organizing. So I find my best places organically to do it through Facebook mom groups, which is great because it's free and it's all good and it's very pinpointed. However, my question is, I get people giving me DMs about, you know, the concepts that they're having and I respond back to them and then I hear crickets. Like, are, do you guys have any tips on how to keep the conversation going? Well, what are they asking you specifically? Can you give us an example? Hey, I love what you do. Tell me more about your services. And then you respond with? With, I would love to talk to you more about your playroom. Let's talk about your specific things. Let's try to set up a phone call or something along those lines, but not in a pushy thing. But then I just get crickets. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I mean I, go ahead. Richard. No, I was just going to say, maybe ask him a question. What are you, what are your challenges or what are you having issues? Mm, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say. Because you, you want to make sure that you're addressing what their, what their problem is. Right. And mm -hmm. ask, getting that information might help. I don't know. Can you, I, what I was going to say, that's a great suggestion because it, even though I know your intention is not like to go right in and be salesy, it's still coming off. Like you're still coming in for the swoop in in, in a right. way. But I think Richard's suggestion is great because you're you're keeping it focused on like what their needs are and you're keeping it simple. And yeah, I think a question, responding with a question would be great. Okay. I would great. say too, if there's anything else that you offer, like um, maybe you want them to sign up for your email list or maybe you have a blog that you do or think about the other offerings that you have that can act as a resource to them. So maybe ask them a question, then offer them an opportunity to be a part of this group or to join this page or um, something where you're providing them value without really asking for anything, but you are asking for something which is ultimately going to be support and then hopefully they turn into a client. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have another question. David, how are we doing on time? I mean, how long do we go? Um. Alicia, what are we doing? We're going, to, let's say, another five, 10 minutes and we'll do kind of post networking. Um, right? Is that what we called for? It was until 1.15 this session and then networking starts at 1.15. Okay, great. So we have like uh, about 10 to 10 or 15 minutes left. There's plenty of questions in the chat, uh, Rich, for sure. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go to the top of my stack and then we'll we'll get to Peter after this. Um, <clears throat> It's from Richard Alpert. I like your first name, Richard. Mm -hmm. um, it says, uh, how can I use social media to help me grow my company email list? I I'm in the book writing publishing space. That's great. Uh, Richard, I think you're a great example of this. You have a really good LinkedIn account and you, your heart law posts a lot of content that is around intellectual property law. Like again, going back to that value add of like, here's not a laundry list of everything I do, right? But here's some information that can be helpful for you, right? And I think once you're putting out valuable content and information, people wanna sign up for more. Like how, how can I engage more, right? So that's serving them up something that's helpful is a good way to build up your email list. And you want, you, if you're putting up really good stuff, you probably won't even have to really ask them for it. But if you, you know, you want to, you could probably say, oh, you know, if you'd like to learn more, you'd like to subscribe, as we like to call it in the social media world, you know, sign up here or give us your email and so on and so forth. But giving people information is invaluable. That's a good way to build up your email list. Good. I think that's, yeah, is there like a special mechanism? I mean, like LinkedIn, what would you do? Direct them to maybe a landing page or something, or you could uh, you... I, on LinkedIn, you could direct them to a landing page on, on Instagram. You can, there's so many ways to do it. Like, so you could put a little, what, there's a link thing called link tree, which is kind of like this sub website to all of your stuff. Right. So in link tree, it's free. You mm -hmm. can click on the link. You can build it where your website there. You can build it where your YouTube channel is there. You can build it where they can get to all your other social media platforms all in one space and, you know, f you know, figure out a way. You could also add a tab where they can add their information or, or you know, subscribe. So Linktree is awesome. And there, there's other ones out there too um, that have come after Linktree, but I like Linktree because it's a one-stop shop to all your stuff. Very good. Uh, Tara? 
Yeah, there's also a site called HubSpot, which is a little bit more advanced, but for anyone that's doing anything with newsletters or mass mailers, uh, I have a lot of clients that use it and it's super organized and has a lot of really advanced settings. So I can put it in the chat if anyone wants to explore it. Um, I personally really enjoy it. Uh, HubSpot though, does that actually integrate with your website? Is that- or It can, or yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it offers so many different things. A lot of people will mostly use it to integrate with their website, but they also have like one-offs and like other opportunities to work with the, the technology. I just find that it's so organized. There's, there's one feature in it where it will automatically like send emails and send messaging to your database. It, it reminds you where you've left off with conversations with who is within the database. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. Well, that sounds uh, that sounds like an interesting tool. So uh, definitely yeah. check that out, Peter. Um, hi everyone. So my question is slightly different. It's not how to um, market myself in social media. It's how to market to social media content creators. Um, and so a little background, as I mentioned before, I have a platform that allows people to have their own custom branded NFT storefronts. And people who are, you know, make a living generating social media content um, are always looking for ways to monetize that, you know, and so if you're not going to go on OnlyFans or Patreon, because that's not your target market, you know, how do they really sort of market themselves? So I, I would like to be able to go to uh, go after them as a target market and say, let's, you know, offer you a way to monetize your huge following, whether it's, you know, your guitar lessons or your makeup or your, you know, wh whatever it is that, you know, you've amassed, you know, these hundreds of thousands of followers uh, that follow you every day for your recipes or, you know, whatever. Um, so any, any suggestions and and how to reach out and market to, you know, social media content creators and influencers? Well, let me ask you this first. What have you tried before to do in the past? Um, so what I've tried in the past is finding out if they have any agencies that represent them. And, and I've done that. Um, and I actually, and, and, you know, and, and I had, I actually managed to set up a meeting with someone who represents multiple um, athletes um, in sort of the action sports, like mountain biking area who create these crazy mountain biking videos and stuff. I'm a mountain biker, so I mm -hmm. follow that stuff. And, um, and I scheduled a meeting and they were like, yeah, this is interesting, but not right now. Gotcha. Another in or another way is typically if they have a pretty large platform, they probably don't follow a ton of people. So I will look and maybe see who their followers are. Right. Okay. A lot of times you can find uh, some people that are behind the scenes that work with them when you look at their followers. Right. So maybe it's somebody who's managing, managing their video content. Maybe it's the person that's really managing their page. A lot of times, a lot of these creators, depending on how busy are, they are, aren't managing their own page. So sometimes that's why you don't get a response. Right. And we get like devastated because we're like, oh, I thought they saw my DM and nine times out of 10, they don't because they, they're not managing their own page. So I would just say, look at who they're following and see if there's anybody in there that has a direct correlation to their platform that you might be able to reach out to that's at a smaller scale that actually will is in, will answer, right, your that's inquiry. It. So that that would be a little tip and trick that might work for you. Great. That's a good thought. Yeah, I definitely agree with that because I can't tell you how many times you know, if you're trying to get to talent, whatever, whether it's somebody that is an athlete or on a television show or whatever it is, um, a lot of times you're going to get to them through not necessarily like their uh, agent, but more so about like their core team of people, like their assistant or um, sometimes their publicist or their intern. And a lot of times you could find this information out, like she's saying, uh, on social, you can even search for titles on LinkedIn. And so that could be a really easy way in. Okay, great. So um, before, before we wind down, uh, David reminded me that we probably didn't say a lot about intellectual property so, um, and, and social media. So David, uh, I, do you have some comments that you'd like to make? No, no comments. I just want to hear Kenya and Tara's comments on this. You know, the use of like 
you know, images that might belong to someone else, potentially could be copyright infringement, you know, quoting someone's brand or trademark may not be fair use. And, you know, I just kind of want to know if, if you kind of dealt with that issue before and kind of what are some best practices or not. Yeah, I think for us, like we're a really big media company. People use our stuff all the time. We use their stuff, right? I think the important thing is that you give credit, right? So, and, and there are like the Instagram police <laughs> that are out there that'll get your, your posts pinched, as we like to say, if you're not giving credit to the source. So just making sure that whatever content you're using, whether it's a picture or it's a video, I mean, obviously the goal of it, all of this is to share, right? That's how stuff like goes viral and hits the algorithm. And, but you want to just make sure that you're, you're giving credit. And typically people are cool with that. I've run into very, no instances, thank you, God, that I've shared somebody's stuff and they're like, oh, don't use that. But I also try to make sure that like, I give them credit, um, for their work and their video or whatever it is I'm using. Great. Yes, I've had a little bit of a different experience, um, particularly with talent that we represented um, from the Housewives franchise. There have been TikTok videos, there have been Instagram videos where the talent is endorsing something that they love, but it's totally done on an organic you know, way of sharing. Like, hey, I love this new face cream or hey, I really enjoy this new beverage that I found, right? Then the brand takes the video, screen records it, and starts using it as advertising or promotion or throws it up into their stories. Not okay. Because there have been many legal instances where they've then had to pay the talent because they're stealing their content. Whether they gave them credit or not, it really is not okay. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very slippery slope. So I would always be very cautious, even if you're giving you know, credit where credit is due, it really, it really doesn't always play out that way. Um, and another thing to just think about is like, how would you feel if somebody took your content and then just started using it to, to monetize and, and, you know, sell more items or whatever it is. So that's yeah. been my experience. Um, one other thing I would say too, is a lot of times, like we've had a lot of clients find success on Shark Tank. And so when we're, um, whether we're putting them in or they come to us later and they've shared these experiences, they're making promotional graphics or videos or they're, you know, making edits to their website and whatnot. And they think they can just use the logo for Shark Tank in their promotions or they can just use the logo. You can't. So there are definitely restrictions that come into play there. And so it's always best to ask if you're unsure because some of them can get a little sticky. Yeah. And that's a great point, Tara, because I would say to protect yourself, and you say you have a piece of content that you created, I mean, figure out a way to add your own watermark to it. Like whether that be through, you know, your, your Instagram handle or your social media, just so like, say it does get used, at least your name's in there, you're getting credit for it. And I'm like, as long as my name is there, share away. Cause if anything, that's just going to drive, um, you know, traffic back to your page, but just make sure that you have a system of like receiving credit regardless of whether they they put it in the post and a good ways just to throw your watermark or your logo yeah, I, in your stuff. I mean, once you post on social media, once you go to a platform, you're basically giving, you know, Instagram, Twitter uh, uh, a license uh, to use the content in any way they want on the platform, right? And so that means people can share it, they can comment on it. If you take content from a third party's content from outside of the platform and you use it without your permission, technically that's copyright infringement, right? Now, if you're just taking your 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 Aunt Martha's recipe for, you know, sweet potato pie or something like that, and posting it, she's probably not going to sue you, right? But if you're taking uh, content from somebody who makes a living by generating their content, then you're going to have, you you do take a risk that there's going to be a, a, an issue there, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. the, other, the other piece is, is that if somebody takes your content and posts it on social media and they take it from, a, you know, from someplace else and they post it, you're not posting it. You can do a DMCA takedown notice, right? And they, and you can approach the Twitter or, or, 
Facebook or Instagram, and they'll police the content for you, right? And so in theory, if it's like a one-to-one -one match, right, they'll, they'll take the content down and, you know, they'll help you protect your rights. So it, it kind of goes both ways. Um, but I think you just have to be, you know, realistic and practical about what you share and, and who you're sharing it from. So that's, mm -hmm. those are my thoughts on it. Um, so we're at the 114 mark. Um, Kathleen, can you, can you ask a question and can we answer it in a minute? I actually have two, so I'm going to do the two questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, the one question is, what is the best way to get followers? And then the second question is, my boss loves LinkedIn. Is there a way that I can um, add groups from the company page? Because it seems like you can only add groups or comment or anything like that from your personal page. Is there a way you can do it that I just don't know about? Those are the two questions. I'll, so I'll start with the first one because I do not know the answer to your second one. <laughs> I'm not sure. So what I will say, how I built my page uh, in the beginning is it was a follow for a follow, okay. which is why I follow way too many people now. And then it's hard to follow new people because Instagram will only let you follow up to 7,500 people before, yes. and then it will block you from following anybody new. So in the beginning, it was, I, I, you follow me, I'll follow you. And that like was how I, I organically built up my page. Now I'm finding I'm getting new followers through content. So like through reels, through video, typically reels has been super helpful because okay. it just hits the algorithm much better than like an organic post. Like somebody might stumble along and see a picture that I post, or if I do a, um, a post a video to my page, it might get visibility, but reels has really been the thing that ha gives you an extension beyond, um, and, and you know, else. and more reach. Yeah. 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 So I think reels is, is just going to be the way moving forward to get new followers and people can, and the cool thing about reels is too, like, you don't have to really worry about someone stealing your stuff because once they share your name and stuff is already in there. So it's like, people yeah. see that. And then they're like, Oh, that's cool. Like, and they'll, and it brings engagement to your page. And then if people like what they see, they'll, they'll follow. And I would say the important thing about people liking what they see on your page is just trying to stay consistent to your brand. Right. Uh -huh. And what for people to expect. So you don't want your page to look all over the place. Right. Nice. And there'd be like so many other things going on from a busy standpoint. Right. And I tell people like quotes are good you know, pictures are good, but like try to be consistent in like your content and that it all is relative in one way, shape or form. Like when people come to my page, they can expect to see stuff about business in regards to passage to profit. They know I'm into fitness. So they'll see something related to fitness. Um, I do some other stuff in, in the movie space. Like they, they, so they know what to expect when they come to my page. And I think being consistent to that and not mm -hmm. all over the place is super key because if they come and your page looks busy, they're not probably not going to follow. Okay, because my what my boss is doing, he is doing a movement that is climate change. And he wants people to join this movement that he's doing. And he's, he told me, no, you must like climate change groups, global awareness, blah, 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 blah. And no one is liking, no one's doing anything. You mean like from Instagram, like you following oh, people Facebook. and people following, Facebook. oh, Facebook. Okay. 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 Yes. Here's so the thing. Working. Yeah. So here's Facebook's different now, right? Like, again, I go back to how organically it used to be the way. And because everything is a paid model now, it's just, it's the algorithm is different, right? So what's once worked before it's, it doesn't necessarily work. I mean, what are you posting? Like, what are your posts like? Um, for example, he would do a gorilla or he'll do a tree that's being cut down or trees that are burning. And then he'll add a story to it. Um, uh, because what's weird about it is that he actually does turbines and he has gotten people to paint on these turbines, very famous people. And, but he wants to uh, bring in climate change in with it to tell a story to associate with the turbines. 
So I am doing turbines and I'm doing um, movement. I mean, you'll see guys in a video uh, striking, saying there's no planet B, there's only a planet A. So that's what I'm posting. So I, so here's an idea for you. Have you ever thought, so you said there's artwork that's being created as part of this cause, right? Yes, yes. And I, for example, um, he doesn't want to do it yet because he says he wants to get lots of followers first because then it looks like his business is not really a business or a, a business, should I say, because so far we have Leonardo DiCaprio, we have The Rock, um, we have... Shannon Elizabeth at the moment, but he says he doesn't want to bring that out yet. And I mean, but that's ridiculous. I mean, that would, that would bring more feet, but he says because he's only got 40 followers, he wants more before he posts celebrities on it. Well, it's yeah. kind of the, it's, it's kind of the counterproductive, right? Cause you know that if he puts Leonardo DiCaprio up there talking about what you're doing, like it's, it will be a home run, right? What exactly. I will say is, what I will say is this, um, because it sounds like you, you're, you're stuck between a little bit of a rock and a hard place. If there yeah. is a piece to the, like a connection to the art world in this, have you it ever is. thought of doing a video of like one of these pieces of artwork being created like that's something that you can create into like one minute content and oh no like, we have already there's okay. a, there's yeah, well, a, it there's a like guy the, yeah it sounds like the content is 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 pretty compelling uh tara do you have any comments and then we really need to go to the oh, networking okay. so maybe Kathleen yeah. could schedule uh something with kenya offline yeah i'm happy to help you brainstorm and, and share a few ide other ideas that i had for you thank you so much <laughs> yeah i i won't say much other than the fact that i think you're definitely moving in the right direction even though it might feel like you're not but content yeah. really is the most important part and so um if you chat with kenya offline i'm sure the two of you can come up with awesome brainstorms that'll help really bring the campaign to life oh fantastic can i get the email please <laughs> sure it is kenya gibson with a P at yes. iHeartMedia.com. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, okay, Kathleen. I'll keep quiet now. <laughs> thank you for uh, uh, thank you for uh, the discussion. I guess, um, and now it's time to wrap things up. So I just want to say thank you to everyone, um, you know, and for uh, attending today. We hope you found that the content is useful. If you have any questions about intellectual property. David's the man, uh, David Postowski. Uh, and so he'd be happy to, to help you out. David, what are we doing next? Yeah, so me, uh, so thanks everyone. Thank you, Richard, that was great. Uh, thanks, Kenya and um, Tara. So yeah, yeah, like we said, maybe in April, we'll have a session all around um, the stories of emerging companies. We'll get back to you on that. Our next scheduled session, um, is going to be like, as always, it's the last Thursday of the month. And so our next one is May 25th um, at 12 p.m. Eastern. And it's all about franchising, the do's and the don'ts and how to um, just how to franchise. So we have some great speakers. Thanks, Richard. Really great job. Thanks so much.